G'day, Dylan O'Donnell here from the Byron Bay Observatory. Byron Bay, of course, recently having an influx of visitors from Sydney and Hollywood and all around the world uh, because suddenly it's a trendy place to live. And now renting a room here costs about a million dollars a week, uh, which is good that I actually decided to live here early on and buy a house and build an observatory. And I could probably rent that observatory out for a lot of money, but I would prefer to keep my own space and do my own space. Really the thing that concerns me most though is that the infrastructure in town is kept to such a level where we preserve these dark skies I have here. I currently get about Bortle 2 to 3 which means I can take RGB true colour images of space pretty easily. I get nice dark conditions and hopefully as the town grows we don't experience a loss of that beautiful dark sky. Now this video today is about my first impressions about the EQ8RH Pro mount. There's been a few different changes I've had to get used to. I'm going to talk about the Southern Hemisphere Polar Alignment Routine. I'm going to talk about the encoder on this particular RH, the high resolution encoder. What is an encoder and why is it important for this? And I'll show you some of the first light images, just really just test images, not proper works, but just things I've been able to capture while I was testing this mount. My name is Dylan O'Donnell and you're watching Star Stuff. What the fuck? Huge shout out to the Binocular and Telescope Shop in Sydney, otherwise known affectionately here in Australia as Bintel. Uh, Bintel are always helping me with my astronomy journey, so if I'm too embarrassed to ask something in a forum, I just ask the Bintel guys and girls, and they usually help me out. And they will be happy to help you out, even if the end result of that help just means a $20 adapter. It's the kind of service that you just don't get anywhere else in this country. They are astronomers themselves and they care about what we do. So hit up www.bintel.com.au, which happens to be the best astronomy website in the world because I made it. And drop my name, tell them that I sent you because then they'll look after you because you're one of my mates. So it's been a long period of not being able to see the sky for me. Uh, thankfully, I'm not the kind of astronomer who needs to go out on a mission and take my portable equipment to do things. Because I have an observatory, I have this luxury of being able to get out there and turn things on when it's clear. Because even with mankind's greatest achievements, we seem to struggle to be able to tell what the weather's gonna do in one hour. In fact, my weather apps will tell me that it's raining and if I go outside, I can see that it's clear. As much as I love the weather apps and I do use them in my planning, let's be honest, they aren't fantastic all the time and they all disagree with each other. And sometimes it's better for me to just go outside and look up. Now, the first thing I should talk about is the polar alignment of the mount. When you have an equatorial mount, you want to point it to your pole. Our pole in this case is octans because we're in the southern hemisphere. And a good little trick I use to rough it in is just to hold my planetarium software, in this case Sky Guide by iOS, which is fantastic by the way. I just hold that up to the pole and I can actually see it over there in the distance. So this mount is already pointed there and I knew it would be roughly polar aligned anyway. Uh, the SynScan calibration is a bit different to what I'm used to. Uh, you only really need a couple of stars to calibrate in, and then it has a polar alignment routine built into the hand controller for the Southern Hemisphere, for any hemisphere and without the need to see the pole. Uh, this was called the All Sky, or no, All Star Polar Alignment in the Celestron mounts. But on these guys, it's just called polar alignment, I'm pretty sure. And I've never been sure why that particular feature isn't documented very well. It's really, really handy. Uh, I'll show you, I'll do a demo video later about that whole process from end to end for polar aligning. But essentially you select a couple of stars, it knows roughly where it is, you tell it the polar align and it takes you away by the error. And then you use the azimuth screws and latitude adjustment to, to correct the error and get it closer to polar alignment. With this, uh, you essentially need to run through that process twice. As long as you run through that polar alignment procedure twice, you get so close that really, it's perfect. But I know what you really wanna see, you just wanna see a good guiding graph, right? I love a good guiding graph, especially when it's my own. To be honest, I don't care about looking at other people's guiding graphs. And so you probably don't care about the one I'm about to show you, but look at these results. When I saw that I was getting not just under one arc second of error, It's 
basically perfect at this point, especially for this long focal length stuff I'm doing. I've got the C11 on here, I'm close to 2000 millimeters focal length, so I'm really zoomed in far into space. So I need that level of precision. Let's just look at it a little bit longer. Now I just want to show you a blinked image set. So these are a set of color images I took the other night. I don't think my focus is perfect on this, but I just wanted to show you that I haven't registered these images. So this is just the set of images that were taken in a row, but even with the dither, look at how stable the image is across, I think this was across half an hour. So you can see that once you're locked onto a target, you're really locked on. I was really happy with seeing this unregistered blink result first up. And I did manage to get a couple of images, some in HA with the ZWO 1600mm. And I was able to crank out a quick couple of test images of space. These are not fantastic images. I haven't spent a good number of hours processing or even capturing the data that I would like, but I'm still in that troubleshooting and problem solving and getting everything tickety-boo. Now, let's talk about encoders. What are encoders? Encoders are a way for the mount to know where it is. These are two axis, basically rotatory motion around two axis and the mount needs to know where it is because when you tell it to go to a particular corner in space, it's gonna use stepper motors to turn the motor a certain direction. Uh, but if we just tell the stepper motor to move, there's no guarantee it's gonna be right on the right place, the right arc second in space uh, without having encoders. So it makes a lot of difference as to the resolution of those encoders. Let me show you an example of a very low resolution encoder. So here is my next dome and I'm controlling this by my phone so I can actually tell it to turn 10 degrees if I want to. You'll see there, there is a small little magnet. This is an example of a magnetic encoder. Essentially it's a one pixel resolution. The dome can go in 360 degrees from end to end. Uh, it doesn't actually know where all of those degrees are. However, it does know about this little magnet here and it knows that that's set to 180 degrees. So if I tell the mount to go home in my software, it senses where that magnet is and goes, that's the 180 degree point. And now on my observatory software, it knows that it's at the 180 degrees mark. Now, of course, for astrophotography and astronomy, we need way more resolution than that. We need to know not just degrees, but minutes and arc seconds on the rotational control of the mount, especially in RA. How do they do it? Usually there's a laser sensor which can read markings on a rotor. Now, I don't know if that's how this one is particularly set up. I don't know if other mounts are set up different ways. However, this has a Renshaw encoder and check out this demonstration on the Renshaw website of an encoder that they use for high speed applications. Not only can it read those markings, tiny markings, it can read them at super high speed and then judge the distance and therefore the speed of this particular motor. Of course, we don't need that sort of speed on a mount, but we do need those small markings and the smaller the markings, the better. So often these markings are measured in terms of microns and the particular encoder in this thing has 11 million ticks. That means in that 360 degree rotation, it's divided up into 11 million different areas which it can optically or with lasers sense those markings and know exactly where it is. So when you tell it to go to a particular position in space, it is going to go to that position in space. Even if the mount has backlash or whatever, it still knows where it is at any time and can adjust perfectly to make sure that motor is where you tell it to be. Now, of course, this begs the question, is it worth the extra $4,000 it costs to have this high resolution encoder on the mount? And honestly, I think it might be the wrong question. I mean, we, you can get away with doing astrophotography without that kind of high resolution encoder. Whether that is worth $4,000 is really up to you. However, I think the better question we should be asking is how much do these encoders cost and how much did it cost Skywatcher to put one into here? Now, I did a quick search and you can get some of these encoders for as cheap as a few hundred dollars, but some of the encoders, especially industrial application ones and high precision ones, like the ones in here, go for several thousand dollars. And that's just for the raw encoder. So you have to wonder what the cost is for Skywatcher to not just buy a supply of these encoders, but to integrate it with their system and integrate it with the drivers that control 
their ASCOM mount. In that sense, I think the $4,000 is probably justified. I don't have any concerns that prices are being gouged here. I think it really is a high level of technology and equipment. And what this means for the end user is that I could essentially guide on a star and then turn the guiding on RA off completely. There is no inherent periodic error because any error can be picked up by the encoders. The encoders know where it should be and it can keep it on track for that perfect RA rotation the whole night long. There is no need to guide out or correct the periodic error at all. Go-tos will be more precise, tracking will be more precise, and unguided tracking is even an option because the mount knows where it is in space, it knows the rotation of the Earth and how far the stars are moving, and it can match that rotation mathematically perfectly because it knows where it is. So I drove to Sydney this weekend and I got a new guitar, which I have to say I love. And it's a self-tuning guitar, which means it has a robot built into it, which is essentially some electronics. Uh, and then I realized that what this essentially is, is an encoder. Let me show you how. So this beautiful Gibson Les Paul has a kind of encoder built into the tuning. It's not strictly an encoder as I've been talking about with magnetic or laser or optical encoders. It's actually an audio encoder. Now, I don't know how these work, but the effect is essentially the same. I can pop out this button, which goes into tuning mode. And the guitar tunes itself perfectly in tune. Now these pegs don't actually have internal markings, I suspect. Uh, it can do this with audio frequencies. It knows that a particular frequency is 440 hertz. So by sensing that with microphones or internal sensors, it can then make adjustments to the stepper motor to get where it is. It's an interesting take on what an encoder is, but essentially it's the same thing. It's a motor that knows where it is based on markings. And those markings in this case are sound. Do you wanna hear me play? Yes, I am thrilled with this new mount. The EQA RH Pro has taken the observatory to another level for me. What I really particularly like is that I can turn the mount on remotely, uh, which means I can be sitting on the toilet with my phone and I can tell the observatory to turn on, send power to the mount, and the mount will then connect to EQ Mod and ASCOM and be ready to go. The hand controller is there if I need it, so it's always plugged in as well. I can just walk outside and use a hand controller at the same time that it's being controlled with a PC and ASCOM. So I'll have more videos about SYNSCAN, the calibration routine, and the polar alignment routine, especially for the Southern Hemisphere. Now, if you're interested in getting this mount, I've had a chat to Bintel, and they've been generous enough to give you a special offer. So if you look down in the description, there'll be a coupon code there to give you a discount on this mount if you're interested, and possibly other Skywatcher mounts as well. That's what you get for being one of my mates. Thanks for hanging out with me uh, on social media and here in the comments. It really makes a difference. It really gives me the encouragement. You guys are full of suggestions and help and things that I can try you are there with me on this journey as well. Because let's be honest, the inspiration for doing all this is not financial. I am so far from the black, it's ridiculous. In fact, my bank balance is so far in the red that it looks like a wedding from Game of Thrones. Anyway, my name is Dylan O'Donnell. You've been watching Star Stuff. Remember, everything's meaningless and we're all going to die.